Um, we're in Romans chapter one, yeah. and uh, we're. Let's see where we ended. Um, and I, I quoted this passage before from Augustine. If you believe in, in his in a dialogue, and he was uh, referring to this person who was arguing, arguing as if you're out there, you've experienced this a whole lot of times. Augustine was pointing out the the foolishness of someone who picks and chooses scriptures that they like and some that they don't like or just reject flat out. Some people, uh, what, what is actually popular among some messianic groups is that they put a hyper emphasis on the words of Christ and they put Paul's words like kind of secondary. Not understanding that Jesus actually he never wrote anything. This was all apostolic. Everything he said was copied from one of either someone that was there or someone that had the information, like Luke, as he carefully investigated the information to which you know to which he had access. Um, Augustine says, "If you believe what you like in the gospel, and you reject what you don't like, it is not the gospel that you believe, but yourself." So if you can pick and choose things in the gospel according to your lifestyle, according to things that you like, and reject other things, don't say that you believe in Scripture because you don't. You don't dice up Scripture. You don't say this is Scripture, this is not. You know, because you don't like it, it's not conducive, or it, it really doesn't work according to your lifestyle because it just shows that your views, your opinion is on a higher authority than the Scriptures. And Augustine, as I would say, you don't believe in the scriptures. You believe in yourself because you are, you are placing yourself in a higher authority by saying this is not true, but this is true. This, we're not talking about varying readings here. We're talking about the teachings in, in scripture, uh, in the gospels, in Paul's letters, Peter's letters, Jude, so on and so forth. People like to discount Paul because the fact of the matter is that Paul defines what morality is and what morality is not. So I understand why people that claim they're Christians would deny many things of the Apostle Paul. Because he wrote the book on morality and Christian living. You know, he tells you what the will of God is for your life in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. This is the will of God. This is the Thelema to Theo, the will of God that you abstain, chapter 4, 1 uh, Thessalonians, that you uh, avoid sexual morality. Now, that go, goes against tons of people that are living, you know, either with their girlfriend or they're, they're practicing sexual morality. I mean, this goes against it. So, of course, they're going to deny something that Paul said. This is the will of God for your life, that you avoid sexual immorality. And then he goes further and he says uh, also don't defraud your brother in these things. That means don't defraud your brother's wife in these things. That's what he's saying here. Don't Because he says these things. And then Paul talks about issues like homosexuality as we'll see in Romans chapter 1 and other places. And the fact of the matter is that there's a growing as we'll see in these last chapters in Romans chapter 1, a growing um, population of professing Christians that are pro-homosexual, or they're, they're, they tolerate it. Even if they don't practice it, that's growing too though, professing Christians that practice it, but that tolerate it. Why do you think that number is growing in the church? But why? Lack of discernment. Lack of teaching. Lack. Well, you said the same thing. It's going because yeah. pastors aren't, a lot of them, not all of them, there's a lot of great pastors out there. Yeah. But too many are not doing their job. Right. And teaching, this is wrong according to scripture. Yeah. You might feel that it's okay, but this is wrong. It's even wrong to tolerate it according to scripture. We speak out against these things. We we have a view. We have to stay strong because 
they have a view and they speak out and they're bold. Yeah. But yet we are silent, you know, we don't want to cause waves in the church or <laughs> controversy, so on and so forth. I was just going to ask, isn't there parts in Revelation that talk about how there will, there will be many false preachers and this kind of stuff will become happening more and more? Well, yeah, um, all through Scripture, talk in uh, Timothy 4, 1 Timothy 4, and so on and so forth, it, it says these doctrines, false doctrines, will keep growing and growing and growing, and I call it a doctrine of tolerance. That's what's growing, a doctrine of tolerance. Let's go to our text. and. Um, Jeff just read uh, Romans 8. There's a Bible there, Peter. I just found that one. Right, and there's a few of them. That one's one, any one you want. There you go. Yeah, I used to use it every week until I brought this. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of glasses. Um, in verses 1820, we went already went through the, these, but um, I'll just go ahead. Oops. That's what it was used for. For the wrath of God is being revealed from God or from heaven against all ungodliness and in righteousness of men who suppress, who keep suppressing, it's a participle there, the unsaved people keep suppressing. Keep suppressing the truth and unrighteousness because that which is known about God is what? Evident. It's evident within them for God made this so. God made it evident within them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, divine nature, have clearly been seen, being understood through, being understood through what has been made in order that, Hana, in order that, this is why, they are without apologetic, without excuse. We looked at that word last time. No reason. For even though they knew God, now keep in mind, God made it evident to the non-believer that what? They're, they're, they're without excuse about what? Creation. Creation. It doesn't say they're without excuse to do what or believe what? Salvation. Redemptive knowledge. It doesn't say that. The context here, it's evident within the evolutionist or the atheist that God made the, the universe. It's evident. How? Look around you. The evidence, God made it clear. And God put it in them, so it's clear to them. So what they're doing, they're suppressing the truth. They keep suppressing the truth. There's no God. We came from Pithecaptopus erectus. There's no God. We came from the apes. And evolution is true. Progressive evolution, whatever kind of ev evolution you want. But they know deep down inside, if you believe in the inerrancy of Scripture, Paul says God made it evident within them that there is a Creator but they keep holding down the truth. So what Paul is actually saying here, there's no such thing as a real atheist. They're lying. There's no such thing. There's no such thing as someone a, who doesn't believe God created all things. But it's not saying, as Dan pointed out, that they're without excuse and God made it evident within them that Jesus Christ is God, creator of all things, and unless you believe in him, you'll die in your sins. It doesn't. Paul's not dealing with redemptive knowledge, but rather knowledge of God as creator. Verse 22, um, I'll start with 21. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became frutal, fut, fut, futile in their speculations, and their, their moronic heart, their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, and that's what they do, they they profess to be wise. They claim they're wise. But they became fools. And here's what they did. They exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for what? Images. Images. Yeah. An image in the form of corruptible man. Yeah. It's, that's very similar to whom? What group Catholic. goes to a, a place where they actually get on their knees and they actually give... A, this what's known as hyperdulia to a statue while they're on their knees praying to her. That's Roman Catholicism. Yeah. When they go to the church, they get down on their knees and they're worshiping, functionally worshiping a created image of Mary. Even if it was really Mary, she's a creature. 
We don't serve in a religious context anyone, as Exodus 20 uh, verse 5 says, you shall serve God only. How is it that you can serve Mary too? When Paul, both Paul and the, the Moses in Exodus cites the Lord, Yahweh, saying, serve me only. Don't worship or don't serve any other gods. Serve in a religious context. Don't do luo. Don't serve in a religious context any other but God alone. An exchange, the incorruptible form of corruptible man, and birds, four-footed animals, and crawling creatures. Can you imagine? They're, they're actually exchanging, worshiping the real God, creator of all things, for four-footed animals. Even today, there's, very, there's many religions who worship creatures and animals and so on and so forth. There's a group in Africa that works, worship the crocodile god. I mean, it goes on and on. We can list a hundred different groups. Um, therefore, because of this, God gave them over in their lust of their hearts to impurity in order that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for what? A lie. And they worship and did what? Served. 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 You cannot serve Mary. Paul is condemning you giving religious service to Mary. He's condemning that. Giving religious service to any other but God is idolatry. Why do we say Roman Catholic Catholicism is a, a false church with significant truths? Because they have significant truths, the virgin birth, the physical resurrection. They assert the deity of Christ. But why do we say then they're a false church? Not only do they practice idolatry by serving in a religious context Mary, but they overtly, officially, canonically deny the sufficiency of, Christ. of the cross of Christ. The work of Christ is completely denied. How is it denied? Because they assert it wasn't good enough. You must pay for your own sins. You must help God. You must help Christ. He's the, the junior, or the help. Christ is the helper savior. He kind of pushes you along. He gives you an opportunity. It's like a, a college. You know, you get a degree. They kind of open the door for some job opportunity. They don't get you the job. Kind of, well, come on, you're on your own now. We did our part. You got to do your part. That's idolatry. Worshiping, functionally worshiping Mary, um, denying the cross of Christ. That is, all that's idolatry because it's a different God. You can't deny the work of the risen Savior and then claim, I'm a Christian. You're denying the Lord and Savior. Paul says this doctrine is what? Anathema. Galatians 1, 6 and 8, right? If anyone comes and preaches a different gospel, even if an angel preaches a different gospel, let him be what? A curse to God. Delivered before God for sacrifice. That's what the term or before wrath, uh, or destruction, anathema, before God. And what was the great heir of Galatians? The doctrine of the Judaizers. Judaizers. What did they teach? You need circumcision to be saved. You need to take some of the, the Gentiles joy. must, in fact, even the word is in there, Judaizer, in Galatians, you must... Uh, live according to the law, the Jewish law. That's what they did. That's what they taught. Particularly circumcision. They were teaching that Gentiles must do that in order to be saved. Not to keep your salvation, but to get saved. Wow. Paul says this is cursed. This is damnable heresy. Damnable heresy, not heresy in the sense of uh, Jeff and I have different end times views, or heresy, you know, you believe in gifts, I don't. Not... It's not talking about those kind of secondary divisions. This is damnable heresy because it rejects the only means of salvation, Christ crucified. It rejects it. That's why Paul was passionate, angry even when he was writing, very short syntax there. Let him be anathema. That's how passionate the apostle, through God the Holy Spirit, carrying him, would to write. So God is saying, let this doctrine be anathema, cursed. If you believe by any other means but Christ crucified that you're saved or justified. 
For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, verse 25, and worshipped and served, served the creature rather than what? The Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. I like how he just kind of ends it there. For this reason, God gave them, verse 26, over to degrading passions for their, look at this, for their women exchanged the what? Natural. Sex. Natural function. For that that is what? Contrary. Now, the homosexual community, the professing Christians, will say that they, that Paul, what Paul is condemning in the passages in which he condemns homosexuality, what he's really condemning is a lustful kind of relationship. Not a meaningful homosexual relationship where you love each other. You know, like, David and Jonathan, you know, that's their key example. But rather a, just a lustful path, that's what's condemned. You know, or pedophilia, that's what's condemned by Paul. Or, you know, some other kind of uh, kidnapping or something. Certainly not a meaningful relationship. And of course, Jesus didn't condemn it, so why should I? I mean, that's the foolishness of their argument. But Paul says it's, it's unnatural. It's not natural. Paul says it. it's not natural. It's not a natural function, a man with a man or a woman with a woman. Paul says it's not a natural function. In the same way, look at the next verse, 27. Also, the men abandoned their, what? Natural function. For women and burned in their desire toward what? One another. Men with men. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving their own persons due penalty of their error. Jeff, read um, the last verse. I think it's 32. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Today. So, now Paul lists some other sins. You're no better than an unbeliever. But, yeah. truly, the ones that are condemned are the ones that are, to be sure, the practicers, but also the ones that, what, approve of such things. And silence is tantamount, I think, to approval. Yeah. You don't say anything, you just watch it go by. Yeah. You're in violation of this these, these kind of passages of approving because you're not doing it. You're not saying anything. How do we witness on the streets to a blatant, you know, we're out there doing public proclamation. What are we supposed to say to a homosexual? What do you think? What do we say to him? What do we say to him? I would say along with all the other sins, murder, Adultery. Yeah, much. All those sins, homosexuality, along with all those, are condemned by God. So I would tell him about. I would give him the list of sins, and I would also include his. But I wouldn't just say that because yeah. then they're going to think you're yeah. picking on them. Right. But you're actually talking condemning all sin, and there's no reason not to bring up the other sins. So, I mean, it's right all along with them. It's along with adultery. It's along. There's a lot with of sins Paul mentioned. It's along with yeah. fornication. It's all right in there with them all. So. Or should we should we well, not? That's say what anything. I've done in the past. Should we not? That's what, what I do. Very or should we just? Yeah, and it doesn't seem like you're. Just kind of say, well, it's not God's best. <laughs> that's a quotation, by the way. Um, here's the thing with homosexuals, as Dan rightly said, with murders, with kidnappers, with all. Yeah. They need first what? Salvation. Yes, yeah. they need the gospel. Yeah. yeah. Because say say we point out how bad, how unnatural scientifically and biblically homosexuality is and say they agree with you. Yeah. And then you never see them again. So what? They die. They die without Christ. Yeah. Believing you about homosexuality, but they die without Christ. we got to preach the gospel. Jeff just read a passage in 7 and 8 of Romans chapter 8. It says, the mind that's possessed by the sarcos is possessed by the flesh. It's a genitive of possession there, meaning you're the non-believer, it says, phonema, their, 
their mind is literally possessed by the flesh, cannot please God, cannot submit to God. It doesn't say choose. U dunamai, it's a, a term that denotes ability. They have no ability to please God or submit to Him. So, you know, you can talk about the biblical prohibition and all these things, but if they're not saved, they have no ability to stop their paganism. They have no ability. They can't even do it, Paul says. They can't. We've got to preach Christ crucified. Then after they're saved. Yeah. I was just going to say the old Puritan method was... You know, it's pretty much a unanimous thing with them is you have to convict them to convert them though. You have to show them that they're in an error, they need to repent, and that you know they're in a place of error. And then, but so their whole thing was to convict them of a sin and then convert them and then give them the gospel. So because they think they think they're fine, most of them think they're fine. They don't say me from what? What have I done? Right. So without the conviction, I mean, God's got to give them that too. Yeah. God's, God's got to give them all those things. Yeah. But it's important for them to understand they're being saved from something. Because a lot of them feel like they're not being saved. What are you saving me from? I'm fine. Right. Sinners of all types. Then they'll bring up the fact of what you were talking about. It's the great acceptance that a lot of churches are having with these. Putting yeah. up dyke preachers and homosexual preachers dyke. up on the stands. And the, you know, <laughs> they'll just say, well, you know, this church accepts it. And this church, you know. They'll say, you're the one with the problem with yeah. it. Yeah. Then they call us hypocrites. Yeah, they call us hypocrites. Passing. Good point. <laughs> yeah, they call us hypocrites in passing. Good point. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. That's true, though. Here's the thing, you know, I'm sure some of you are aware of this. Before 1962, um, sodomy was a crime. Right? I mean, it was illegal in every state. So it's pornography. It was um, illegal in every state before 1962. Now, you know, um, here's the thing. I understand when a non-believer sees homosexuality as permissible, as long as you love them, as long as you're not doing no, anyone no. Hard, a harm, you know, hey, that's good for you, your Christianity, that's good for you. You know, I understand that whole thing, because pagans think differently. We just, Jeff just read a pass, two passages that, that says the non-believer can't, has no ability to please God. Total inability. So I understand the pagan. Here's where it's very frustrating. When the professing Christian has these views of tolerance with abortion, homosexuality, you know, are they really Christian? How can a Christian, yeah. you know? That's why we need more John Hayes. We need solid teaching out there that condemns, that that points out why it's, because a lot of, also a lot of times pastors will condemn, but they don't tell you why it's wrong, they just condemn it. They just don't like it. But they don't point out the passages that specifically point out that homosexuality is an abomination. It's so bad, as we'll see, that Leviticus 18 and 28 calls for their death. It's a capital punishment. How many of all the 600 and over 600 laws, how many were deserving, says Yahweh, of capital punishment? Very few, right? Adultery, homosexuality, not honoring your parents, yeah. right? Um, but homosexuality was in that list. Yeah. Now we know sin is sin. We're not suggesting that one sin is lesser, but it was more abominable and it deserved capital punishment, according to the Lord. But what does that say for an all-loving all God? That he's not an all-loving God. Well, I would say he is an all-loving God. Yeah. If he's not an all-loving God, that would be inconsistent with his nature. But it's how we define love. There's something called holy justice. What does it say in Psalms 5.5? 5, 5? Who knows that? David speaks of Yahweh by divine inspiration and he says... Angry with the wicked. And in Psalm 7.11 it says, Yahweh, it says God is angry every day. In Psalms 5.5, 5, someone read Psalms 5.5 5 for me. Five, five. The arrogant cannot stand in your presence. You hate all who do wrong. You do what? You hate all who do wrong. 
Gosh, your, your translation actually says hate? Yeah. Wow. Because the, the term there is, is trans, translated as hate. But when it's th these passages, or in Proverbs, it says there are six things I hate. There's seven that's an abomination. Two of the things he hates, it's not a thing, it's a person. He, God says, I hate those who, what, cause discord. discord among... I hate those that do that. And also he hates a, what, false Preacher. witness. That's what it says. A, liar. a false witness. He doesn't say there he hates the sin, but he hates those that do it. Now, we can't misconstrue that to mean because it says, I hate those who practice iniquity, that it's the same hate we have on earth coming from our super fallible, evil nature when someone cuts us off. We hate that person. It's not that kind of, it's a holy hatred. It's a just hatred. It's that kind of holiness that exudes, that God embraced, or that, that is on the person that sins. It's a holy hatred. Can't deny the text, but let's not put earthly categories on God. But the fact of the matter is he detests all these practice iniquity. He's angry with the wicked all day long. He's perfect in righteousness, but he takes a dim view at those that say Jesus is Lord, and then they dishonor him by their practice, or what else dishonors them? Their tol toleration. Just tolerating it dishonors him. What do you say about the false prophet or the false teaching in um, Matthew chapter 7? He says, watch out or be aware of what? False, false prophets. What's a false prophet? A Biblically speaking, what's a false prophet? You have that? What else? What's a false prophet? Give me an example of a false prophet. Jehovah Witness. Yeah. Show a witness, or even more Shepherd so. Knows. Now keep in mind, a false teacher prophet used synonymously. Someone who speaks for God, but they do it falsely, or they teach falsely. According to the Apostle Peter, and in Deuteronomy 13, even if they get the pro... Can they get the prophecies right? Yes. Yeah, Deuteronomy false 13 false. says the false prophet, mm -hmm. he gets the prophecies the right. Because we're not denying that he has a something in him. Yeah, yeah. He has a power. He has an inspiration, but yeah. it's not God. But Peter defines, and the Lord in Deuteronomy 13, even if the false prophet prophesies, you know, and they get it right, they and they take you to other gods, they must be stoned. In other words, the false teacher biblically defined is not someone who says, um, you know, I believe you should be baptized with Coca-Cola. You know, or someone who has a different in time, or someone who has a different uh, view on Matthew 20, 26. But rather, someone that has a different, according to Peter, he calls it, these people are engaging in damnable heresy. Paul says there must be heresy in 1 Corinthians 11, to see which, who the light of Christ is shining on. But then it's something called damnable heresy. And Peter called speaks of damnable heresy of the false teachers. What's damnable heresy? Belief that doesn't believe in that. Person works hate Perfect. of Jesus Christ. It's some, something that denies something about Christ, whether his work or his person, as Dan said, person or finished work. Why? Because now you're talking about a different Christ. If I have a different view of the Abrahamic covenant than Jimmy does, that's not damnable heresy. Or say you and I, did, you think it's a, a uh, regional flood, I think it's a universal flood, or, or you think it's a, a young earth, I think it's an old. These are all secondary things. Jimmy speaks in tongues before he comes to this class. I don't. I'm, so we disagree, but we're still Christians because all of us are embracing the risen Savior. We're embracing him. That's why we're Christians. That's why we're saved. But if Neil says, well, I believe Jesus was created and he's not God, Okay, now we're talking damnable heresy. We're not talking about divisions that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 11. Heresius is used, the term heresy is used. But damnable heresy because it somehow denies something about Christ. 
One is Pentecostalism denies the Trinity. That's damnable heresy. They're not saved. Mormons deny monotheism. That's damnable heresy. They're, they're denying something about God. Jehovah's Witnesses deny the deity of Christ and the Trinity. Oneness, Jehovah's Witnesses, the Muslims. What are the, Jeff, what do they all have in common? They all distort who Christ is. They all distort to Christ and they have the same concept of God. A unipersonal God. A one-person God. That's scary. Thereby denying the self-disclosure in Scripture of the triune God, the only true God, and His Son, Jesus Christ. Um, so, that is damnable heresy. As Dan said, you, you deny something about the finished work and person of Christ. Not, you know, um, he's an NIV only, I'm not, you know, but that's not... Yeah. <laughs> of course, the KJV only gets very close to that. <laughs> they're so, because they're very... The KJV only groups are very cultic. They're sociologically cultic. Mm -hmm. Cultic. Mm -hmm. I can't say they're all not saved, but they're cultic. And yeah. I think they dishonor God because they engage in, bibliog um, they, in, in uh, bibliolatry, a worship of the Bible, of a translation. They're worshiping a translation. It's here. The Greek texts and the other writings and you're, you are here. In fact, many assert that if you're using something other than a King James, you're probably not even saved. Yeah, okay, that's cultic. That's, that's damaging to the body of Christ. That's wrong, and it shows a just misguided, distorted epistemology in the way they look at things. Um, anyways. Well, that's sowing discord, for certain. Show, absolutely. Oh, it distracts an evangelism. You know, you separates brothers and causes a lot of grief. Because the King James and the NIV, yeah, it does. translations communicate the Word of God. They communi yeah. Historically, many people have been saved through the King James Bible because it communicates Christ crucified, the deity of Christ. But then to divide, causing dissension among the brethren, yeah. is what God exactly talks about in Proverbs. I hate those that do that. I, can you imagine Yahweh saying, I hate, I hate you because you're doing this? Scary stuff. Predictably, um, these people all make the same assertions in homosexuality. Normally, some of the main assertions to conform to their lifestyles. Um, hey, I was born this way. Yeah. <laughs> Why would God condemn it if I was born this way? God made me this way. God made me to win. I'm a winner. I was born this way. This is what I am. I'm the image of God, and this is how he made me. How can you condemn me? This is how... Um, and then in Le Leviticus passages, they will reduce. Now this is just a brief overview. They reduce the man with man. You know, man should not lay with a man as he does a woman. They reduce that to temple prostitution. It's not really the again the meaningful, you know, uh, relationship that Jonathan and David had. This is temple prostitution. That was condemned, not just the man laying with man. I mean, this is how they distort the text. Um, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, uh, 1 Timothy 1, 10 are primary passages, we'll go there in a second, where, again, they have to somehow, somehow avoid the, clean, the clear teachings in those passages by reducing the references to homosexuality to pedophiles, prostitution, um, you know, not a monogamous, male-to-male -male kind of relationship. They bluntly disagree with the biblical, uh, as we'll see, prohibitions against homosexuality. And those who practice homosexuality and those who tolerate it, they sacrifice the absolute authoritative word of God. They sacrifice it, throw it away for the sake of their own lifestyle, for the sake of their tolerance for the sake of their philosophy. And it's not just homosexuality. We, you know, we got to check out ourselves, all of us, because we may be doing the same thing. Dan and I always talk about justifying, you know, how we used to justify different sins. It's easy to do, right? I can get any text and just oh. kind of contort it and yeah. squeeze out this weird meaning. Say, see, yeah, it's okay. I've seen drugs, um, people that do marijuana, they use scripture in Genesis and say, well, God made the plants. 
um, they opium too. Or the yeah, or the everyone uses First Timothy. To, you know, quit drinking water, but say you know every drunk this side of town will use First Timothy to say that uh, Paul was prescribing wine. You know, the Bible has a lot to say about homosexuality. Um, oh, another argument is Jesus never condemned homosexuality, so why should I? You're condemning something that Jesus never condemned. The fact of the matter is, is there a passage where Jesus said homosexuality is wrong? Yeah. Is there? Where? Romans. Jesus. Jesus didn't write oh, Romans. Jesus. In the Gospels. Well, before you answer that, yeah. keep in mind, just like the, the assertion, uh, Jesus never claimed to be God. No, he never said, I am God, in those exact words. But what he did say was more definitive and more divine and more unambiguous because if he would have said I am God who claimed they were God? Angels were called God. Judges were called gods. False gods were called gods. Moses was called God to Pharaoh. Everyone's called God. Right? So if Jesus said, if he were to say I am God, well maybe he was saying he was a good judge. They were called gods. Or maybe he was saying he's a an angel. He's Michael. I'm God. A God. They were called gods. So he made him a little lower than the gods. Um, but the fact of the matter is, Jesus made claims like, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and end, the first and last. Yahweh alone claimed to be the first and the last in Isaiah 41.4. He claimed to be first and last in Isaiah 44.6. He claimed to be the first and last in Isaiah 48.12. Only Yahweh. Now the term God was claimed by others, false gods also, but not first and last. I am, ego eimi, only Yahweh claimed that. In fact, in Isaiah 44, or 41, 4, both terms are used. I am the first and the last, I am. He uses both things, both divine titles, Yahweh does, in 41, 4. Deuteronomy 32, 39 See now that, that I am, there's no gods beside me. He says, I am there, Yahweh. No one else uses the term I am the, from Anahu in the Hebrew. He go in me in the Septuagint. Nobody else but Yahweh. 48.12, he uses both, the I am and the first and the last. So Jesus used those terms so no one would misunderstand. And the fact of the matter is the Jews understood perfectly what he was claiming. How do we know that? They want to stone him. They wanted to kill him. Yeah. I was asked the Muslims, and Jehovah's Witnesses, why did they want to kill Jesus? I had one Muslim say, nowhere in the New Testament did they want to kill Jesus. Wow. And I just told the crowd, I love when people say that. You know? <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, they wanted to kill Jesus in John 5, because he said, my father, he's, what did he say? He said, my father is working, oh, right, okay. until now. I, too, am working. Right? Mm -hmm. And then the Apostle says, not the Jews, not the Romans, but the Apostle John says, not only, because it says the Jews sought all the more to kill him. John said this. Not only did he break the Sabbath. Not only did he uh, alluin, loose the Sabbath. He's the Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. It wasn't made for God, it was made for man. He loosed the Sabbath, or broke the Sabbath. Not only did he do that, but he was calling... God, his own father, making himself equal with God. That's what John said. He was making himself equal with God. And he was saying that's why the Jews sought all the more to kill him. And the term calling God his father, the term calling is elegin. It's a, an imperfect tense, as with the word aluin, breaking. The import of an imperfect tense can denote a repeated action. So what is it saying? This wasn't the first time he was calling God his own father. This was not the first time. He, apparently, he had been calling God his own father, and he had been he had been loosing the Sabbath because he's the Lord of the Sabbath. He's greater than the temple, and they wanted to kill him in John chapter eight. He said, "Abraham, rejoice at seeing my day." He rejoiced at seeing my day. Christ said this, and he saw it, and he was glad. Jeff, is there an Old Testament law that instructs you when an angel commits blasphemy to stone him? To stone him? The angel. Stone the Stoning angel. angels, is that in... No. I haven't found that one yet. 
Jesus said before Abraham, Ginomai, springing to existence, I am. I am. See the contrast in the verb? A punctiliar event, spring and born before Abraham was born, and then he contrasts it with I am. The, the, the indicative there, present tense indicative, emi. Ego, emi. Now, how did the Jews respond? They picked up stones, just like John 5, when Jesus claimed God was his father. They picked up stones to kill him. To kill him. Because they understood the significance of claiming this I am in the absolute sense because they knew that only Yahweh. They were very familiar with Deuteronomy, the Torah, were they not? Yeah. Deuteronomy 32, 39, that was the song of Moses. Who didn't know that if you were a Jew? Where Yahweh claims, I am. I kill and I give life. I have wounded and I have healed. And nobody can snatch you from my hand. Remember what Jesus said in John 10? The same thing. Nobody can snatch you from my hand. Which brings us to the other set, uh, the other case of where they wanted to kill Jesus. When he says in John, or John 10, verse 27, the reason why you do not believe is because you're not my sheep. Jeff, what be the would be the opposite to that that he did not say? He didn't say that you could believe and then become a sheep. He didn't say the reason why you're not my sheep because you don't believe. He didn't say that. He said the reason why you don't believe, he goes back to Romans 8. Because you're not my, one of my sheep. Only sheep believe. If you're a goat, you don't believe. You cannot submit to God. You cannot please Him. You're not even able to. Only sheep believe. Then he says, now this sheep salvation context, that was a Yahweh context. He says, I give them, they, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. Psalms 95, 7. We are, He is our God, we are the people of His pasture. And the what? The sheep of His hand. Here comes Jesus saying, I give, my sheep hear my voice, I give them eternal life, and they shall never, this is us, we're a sheep. He says, never, never, not even a possibility. That's how strong that Greek construction was. Ume, it's a double negative followed by a sub. No possibility, never, never, not even a possibility will you perish. And he says, nobody can snatch you from my hand. The Father is greater than all, and no one can snatch you from my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Then what happened? They, the Jews picked up stones. they wanted to kill him again. They wanted to kill him. They understood. You know, we always use verse 30 to show the deity of Christ. I and the Father are one. But it starts in 27, when he starts claiming he has sheep. And he starts claiming, I give I give them eternal life. I Just like in Mark chapter 13, and time... We see the, this end time revelation about Jesus. He sends forth. Who does Jesus send forth at the end time? His angels. Jesus has angels. Muhammad didn't have angels. Michael the archangel doesn't have angels. But here in Mark chapter 13, denoting the end time, I will send out my angels. And then it says about Christ, he will gather his elect from the four corners of the earth. His elect? His angels? Only God has angels. Only God can gather the elect. Nobody else. The Son of Man coming in the clouds. Coming in the clouds. So, they understood in these three places in Scripture, they understood the implications of what Jesus was claiming. He was claiming to be equal with God, verified by the Apostle John. And the Jews understood. Unless you don't believe Scripture, the Jews understood what he was saying. There's much to say, back to our text, there's much to say about um, the topic of homosexuality in the Old Testament law. Uh, Leviticus 18.22 uh, You shall not lie with a male as one lies with a female. It is an abomination. I mean, do you think kids have the capacity? This is so simple. A little a kid, a, a Sunday school kid can understand this. You shall not lie with a male as one lies with a female. I mean, you don't even have to be, you know, super smart. You know, this is not some obscure Hebrew passage here. 
And then Leviticus 20, 28 actually. Um, if there's a man who lies with a male, as those who lie with a woman, both of them have committed a detestable act. They shall surely be put to death, and they their blood guiltness, guiltiness upon them. Which passage is that, Eddie? Leviticus 28. It is uh, starting with... Uh, I mean 20, I'm sorry. 2013. So both in um, Leviticus 18 and 20, I think I said 28 before, but it's 20, there's clear-cut passages. And in verse 13 of chapter 20, they shall surely be put to death. Their blood guiltiness is upon them. How does God feel about a man laying with a man? They surely shall be put to death. Their blood guiltiness is upon them. In spite of the clarity of these passages, liberal theologians, pro-homosexual advocates, attempt to downplay, as I said before, these Old Testament precepts, limiting the homosexual prohibition to a um, some kind of cultural meaning, like a temple prostitution. However, if these pro prohibitions were speaking only against temple prostitution, why then are only males mentioned here? If it's only speaking about prostitution. And actually, um, if you look at the context of these passages, they're sandwiched in between other um, laws concerning sexual behavior. You know, like sex with an uncle, aunt, an animal, and all these things. So the context does not allow for such a limitation of temple prostitution. It encompasses everything with males and males. What's interesting is the law does speak specifically about temple prostitution, but not here in Deuteronomy 23. That's where we find the prohibition on temple prostitution, not here. The fact of the matter, these laws were not vague or, you know, um, in fact, D.A. Carson says it's just a pathetic garb when people with no exegetical skill try to mangle these you know, try to prove that the Bible um, does not condemn homosexuality. Um, I think we're going to stop here. We'll deal with David and Jonathan while we stop here.